So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, on this uh, rainy afternoon, uh, thank you for coming to this event entitled Legal Strategies for Fighting Back, a conversation with top immigration lawyers. I'm David Carrasco, the Neil Rubenstein Professor of Latin American Studies at the Harvard Divinity School in the Department of Anthropology, and it's my real pleasure to welcome you to this event sponsored by the Harvard's DACA Seminars. The Harvard DACA Seminar works to open up spaces of learning and dialogue to our campus and the larger community around questions related to the termination of DACA and TPS deportations, the current state of immigration policy and practice, and its implications for young people, their families, and communities. The DACA seminar at Harvard sees this wind down period of DACA as a window through which to discuss not only DACA, but also a host of immigration related issues that impact a wide range of the American public. My way of saying that is we're trying to help the new demography become a better democracy. And leading the conversation today um, in this event is uh, Christine Desan. Now let me also say that this project is, um, has a list of supporters, including the Harvard Graduate School of Education, Inequality in America Initiative, Harvard University's um, Faculty of Arts and Sciences, the Committee on Ethnicity, Race, uh, uh, Migration and Rights, the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History, American Act on a Dream and Define America. Professor Christine Desan, who's going to be leading this event, is the co-founder of Harvard's program on the study of capitalism. She teaches about the international monetary system, constitutional law of money, constitutional history, political economy, and legal theory. Her work brings together classes, resources, research funds, and advising aimed at exploring these topics. With its co-director, Professor Sven Beckert from History, she's taught the program's anchoring research seminar, the Workshop on Political Economy of Modern Capitalism. Since 2005, her research, her research explores money as a legal and political project with an approach that aims to open economic orthodoxy to question, particularly insofar as it assumes money as a neutral instrument and markets as autonomous phenomena. She's recently published a book, I love this title, Making Money, Coin Currency and the Coming of Capitalism. She's on the board of the Institute of Global Law and Policy, is a faculty member in the Program on American Studies. And I like this fact as well, in Brookline, Massachusetts, she served for 10 years on a town committee that researched and drafted legislation promoting campaign finance reform and that supervised that reform once it was enacted. So please welcome Christine Desan and this wonderful panel. So it was a very nice intro, but basically I'm just here to turn it over to these, to these uh, immigration experts. And uh, I'll do that in a moment. I just want to welcome you first to this discussion of the, as I see it, how we treat uh, one another and what we do when borders get in the way of that. A, a word about the way that we've structured this discussion. What we hope to do is, um, Dan is going to, uh, whom I'll introduce, Dan is going to talk briefly, uh, give us an overview of the area and um, help us think about the large issues that are really structuring issues of executive and democratic power um, and authority and decision making that are structuring this area. Then we'll turn to Mike Wishney who will talk about DACA in a little bit more detail. And then we'll talk uh, to Sebi, who will give us some information about TPS. And then Debbie Anker will, uh, will anchor, as it were, the session uh, talking about enforcement issues. So let me tell you a little bit about these people. They are basically all my heroes. And uh, so I'm not going to take much time from their airtime. Dan Canstrom is a professor of law uh, at Boston College, this, at the Center of Human, human uh Boston College Center for Human Rights and International Justice. 
He teaches immigration and refugee law, international human rights law, constitutional law, administrative law, and international human rights. He was the founder of the Boston College Immigration and Asylum Clinic, and students there represent uh, indigent uh, non-citizens and asylum seekers. Together with his students, he's won many high-profile immigration and asylum cases and provided counsel for hundreds of clients for more than a decade. His current project is the Post-Deportation Human Rights Project, which tries to conceptualize and develop a new field of law while representing U.S. deportees abroad and undertaking empirical study uh, of the effects of deportation. And my understanding is just returned from one such trip. Uh, Mike Wishney will, uh, will follow and, as I said, talk a bit about DACA more specifically. He's the William O. Douglas Clinical Professor of Law and counselor to the dean at Yale Law School. His <coughs> teaching, scholarship, and law practice have focused on immigration, labor, and employment. Uh, for years, he and his students have represented low-wage workers, immigrants, and veterans in federal, state, and administrative legislation, litigation. Excuse me. Then we'll turn to Sebi, Sabrina Ardalan, uh, the assistant director of the Harvard Immigration and Refugee Clinical <coughs> Program at the clinic. Sebi supervises and trains law students working on applications for asylum and other humanitarian protections. Uh, she works also on appellate litigation and policy advocacy and has authored amicus briefs submitted to the Board of Immigration Appeals as well as the federal district courts and circuit courts of appeals, all with cutting edge, uh, on cutting edge issues in U.S. asylum law. Debbie Anker is the clinical professor of law and founder and director of Harvard Law School's Immigration and Refugee Clinical Program. She's taught law school law students at Harvard for more than 30 years. She is the author of a leading treatise, Law of Asylum in the United States, and has co-drafted groundbreaking gender asylum guidelines and written many amicus curiae briefs. Uh, she's one of the most widely known asylum scholars and practitioners in the United States and a pioneer in the development of clinical legal education here at Harvard. I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Dan. We'll hear from him and then Mike, then we'll have a few questions, and I'm going to try to move it along to Sebi and Debbie and more questions. Thank you very much. Can people hear me? Yes, I think so. I'll just stand. Um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to speak to you as part of this timely, excellent series. Uh, no, I think they can hear me. Oh, it's <laughs> Well, then. Because I have a, a mic. Yeah, you don't want to use both. Don't want to use both. That's what I thought. Um, still an honor and a pleasure. Um, and uh, I want to heartily commend the organizers uh, of this. I've been asked to offer some historical and some conceptual framing to help us assess the current legal scene relating to DACA, TPS, and immigration law more generally, where we are, how we got here, where we may be headed. Obviously, this will far exceed um, the limits of my eight to 10 minutes. Uh, one actually hardly knows where to begin, but uh, if I limit myself to that time, which I will do, uh, I just want to give an overview and suggest some large themes to which we might return in our discussion. I promised Mike Wishney that I would not mention either John Rawls or Jurgen Habermas in my opening <laughs> remarks. You can ask him why. So I want to begin with a quotation from Henry Hart who likely quite close to here once wrote, quote, judicial review in exclusion and deportation cases provides a testing crucible of basic principle, end quote. And I, I hope that we may consider today how that testing crucible is actually working and whom it is testing. To put it most simply, I believe that we now face a tectonic moment in the political legal history of immigration and constitutional law. This is a moment that demands sharp critical analysis <clears throat> detailed empirical study, creative energetic scholarship, and lawyering that combines effectively with political activism, thoughtful and principled judging, and most fundamentally, a serious reconsideration of first principles. I would suggest that to understand the current litigation landscape regarding DACA, TPS, and other aspects of immigration law, we need to situate those cases against a broader backdrop. So let me start with a brief overview of some types of cases that are percolating throughout the legal system. I think our current chapter is best understood by focusing on a few <coughs> fairly recent and quite dramatic doctrinal developments since the Bush and Obama administrations that reflect potential and in some cases actual reconceptualizations of legal doctrine and of the proper and necessary judicial role. On the constitutional front, for example, in 2010, 
Padilla versus Kentucky called into question a long-standing doctrine that deportation is not punishment for constitutional purposes. This has enormous potential implications that are still being explored. Last year, the court in Sessions versus Morales Santana struck down a citizenship provision that treats mothers and fathers differently when determining a child's citizenship, calling such inequality, quote, stunningly anachronistic, end quote. This is a framing that I think could apply to much immigration law doctrine, as many in this room know. Sessions versus DeMaia, still pending, seeks to apply void for vagueness doctrine onto immigration statutes. So there's a lot happening in terms of the constitutionalization of immigration questions. Not all trends are progressive, of course. Justice Breyer's 2001 opinion in the Zadvidas case, which set limits on post-removal order detention, seemed to many of us to herald a more energetic approach to constitutional avoidance statutory interpretation, as had Justice Stevens' 2001 opinion in a case called Sancier. But just last week in Jennings versus Rodriguez, as I expect many of you know, we learned that Justice Kennedy's dissent in Zadvidas was a 15-year harbinger of his joining with Justice Alito to reject constitutional avoidance as a method to resolve potential constitutional issues with the indefinite detention of non-citizens. This still leaves major constitutional questions unanswered, but I am not optimistic about what's going to happen with that. As for the challenges to DACA rescission, as I expect we all know, the Trump administration's direct appeal to the Supreme Court via um, cert before judgment was rejected just on Monday. So DACA is more or less intact for at least another year as the case returns to the Ninth Circuit. This raises a host of complicated legal, political, and activist-related questions that I expect we'll talk about. There are many different legal arguments at play here, ranging from constitutional arguments that DACA rescission betrays a bias against Mexicans, to very technical administrative law type arguments that there was no evidence beyond a mistake of law, and the mistake of law for the administration was that DACA was itself illegal to support rescission and that therefore such action is arbitrary and capricious. This arbitrary and capricious argument, by the way, harkens back actually to the 1950s, but uh, more immediately to a short but portentous opinion written by Justice Kagan in 2008 called Judalong, which I expect most of you are not familiar with, which highlighted the possibility of APA arbitrary and capricious review of certain types of agency immigration decisions. Of course, a major difficulty of the DACA litigation is that challenges to rescission have to be reconciled in some way with the 2015-16 DAPA decisions in Texas versus United States. DAPA was an expansion of DACA that was challenged by 26 states on APA and constitutional grounds. The Fifth Circuit, in a very dubious ruling, found that states had standing. This turned out to be a very important issue for the later travel ban litigation, and it then upheld a district court injunction based primarily on the failure to follow APA notice and comment procedures, though the court also said, quote, that DAPA was an unreasonable interpretation that was manifestly contrary to the INA. The Supreme Court then split on this 4-4 with Merrick Garland casting the deciding vote. So the Fifth Circuit decision stood. <laughs> I might also note with some annoyance that the Obama administration had argued that that case was not justiciable at all. Regarding TPS, temporary protected status, I would highlight two lines of challenge to the administration's ending of various grants. First, on January 24th, a most interesting lawsuit was filed by the NAACP in Maryland in which it argued that the decision to rescind TPS for Haitians discriminates against immigrants of color in violation of the Fifth Amendment. Essentially, the lawsuit claims that DHS took irrational and discriminatory government action based on race and national origin. I personally found quite striking a statement by Sherilyn Eiffel, the president and director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. She said, quote, this is a simple case. Our democracy rests on the bedrock principle that every person is equal before the law. Governmental decisions that target people based on racial discrimination violate our constitution, period, end of quotation. Now this would of course be very clearly true in almost any legal arena other than immigration law, but in our strange little realm, it is to say the least a bold idea. I happen to think it's a good idea. 
Other TPS issues are much more technical, but in some ways equally significant. Two circuits have now allowed TPS applicants to adjust their status if they can fit into an immigrant category, and a similar New York class action was filed last week. The DACA and TPS cases connect in complicated ways to the so-called travel ban litigation, which is now finally before the Supreme Court as well. <clears throat> Matters of statutory interpretation also involve this allegedly comprehensive nature of the Immigration and Nationality Act. There are still big questions about standing. But most interesting to me are these profound questions of constitutional law. Does the Establishment Clause restrain executive action to, to exclude non-citizens? If so, what are the implications for other aspects of statutory Im immigration law that exclude anarchists, socialists, and various other people? How should we understand the 2015, 2015 court decision in Kerry versus Din, which seemed to reject constitutional analysis abroad? What are the implications for due process and equal protection arguments at or near the border? What is the current understanding of the facially legitimate and bona fide test enunciated in the Nixon administration case of Kleindienst versus Mandel? What might a constitutional victory mean for challenges to expanded expedited removal and so on? Finally, let me mention a few seemingly esoteric issues. Judges have become, in my opinion, more energetic than usual in slowing the gears of the deportation machine. I call this monkey wrench judging but I'm sure better terms are available. One judge in New York, and I don't mean anything pejorative by monkey wrench, by the way, that just means throwing a, you know, a wrench into the gears of the machine. One judge in New York wrote recently of a, quote, right to say goodbye, end quote. Judge Saris in Boston recently recognized that post-departure motions to reopen may constitute irreparable harm, and she granted a preliminary injunction in a case involving the rather summary and cynical removal of a group of Indonesian Christians in which I submitted an expert witness affidavit. All of this, I think, demands confrontation with some very basic political legal questions. Are we or are we not a nation of immigrants? Now, this may seem abstract to the point of banality, but I still think it's crucial. And I will add, so does the Trump administration, apparently, as just last week, USCIS changed its mission statement by replacing the phrase, quote, USCIS secures America's promise as a nation of immigrants, unquote, with, quote, USCIS administers the nation's lawful immigration system while protecting Americans, securing the homeland, and honoring our values, end quote. I hope the difference here is obvious to you. It matters, I think, for reasons that go far beyond the rhetorical. It implicates the agency's understanding of its role and how it will interpret the statutes. But it also reflects our deepest commitments to equality, to diversity, to social dynamism, to human rights, to family unity, to refugee protections, and so on. So, to understand current legal trends, we must recognize that immigration law remains a work in progress in which the very existence and the boundaries of constitutional rights are still in many ways undetermined. Precedents from the 19th century and the McCarthy era are still routinely cited. But we still, it seems to me that the Trump administration understands this quite well. We therefore live in a time when technical legal arguments play an unusually large role in political and ideological struggles. We pay, face a particularly cynical and brutal assault on the rights of non-citizens through the harsh expansion of an exclusion and deportation system that was already oppressive by any normative, comparative, or historical measure. I personally believe deeply that it's my job and my responsibility to protect people as best I can from all of this. This is a moral imperative, but it's also a pragmatic legal imperative. Put simply, our task is not one of charity or protection. It's one of solidarity, progressive advancement, and preservation. This is the essence of Hart's testing crucible. It's our task to figure out how to pass this historic test. Thank you. Do you want the, do you want the mic? Do you want this? Uh, can you hear me up here okay? Is there a mic up here? We can also just holler. Can you hear me okay in the back? What's that? Okay. Here. Uh, let me take this. That's right. Thanks. Thank you. Can you hear that? You're good. Okay. Um, uh, well, thank you so much uh, to the organizers for including me in this and for having uh, this event today. Um, maybe I'll uh, pick up with some of Dan's remarks, starting with Habermas. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. I, I will uh, uh, pick up from some of his remarks, however. So I think my job is to uh, move from the broader conceptual landscape and some of the historical precedents that Dan touched on closer to the present day. And in particular, I'm going to talk about the struggle for DACA. Um, uh, I want to say, actually ask off the top, um, how many people here are students? How many are law students? How many people here know someone who has DACA? Okay. So um, kind of bottom line first, uh, number one, I think we're here today even talking about DACA because young people led one of the most extraordinary human rights movements of the 21st century anywhere on the planet. Um, young people courageously came forward, often outing themselves, and demanded that their humanity be recognized. And when President Obama announced DACA, it was not because his policy advisors in the White House had written him some memos and thought this was a good idea. It was because young people had taken to the streets uh, and to social media and to uh, every other forum and had demanded uh, basic human respect. So we're here talking about protecting DACA um, because that's something that young people secured. And I think that if DACA survives, it's going to be because young people will have led the fight to preserve it. That's true somewhat in the courts. It's certainly true in Congress and in the streets, which is where truly DACA will be won or lost. So um, when I say young people have played a part uh, in the DACA cases, there are, so I'm gonna do a kind of quick run of the DACA cases. This can easily become a, a very complicated final exam question in advanced civil procedure. I'm gonna stay away from that if I can. Um, there are, uh, uh, something like 11 lawsuits pending challenging the termination of DACA. Five of them were filed in the Northern District of California and were grouped together. Two of them were filed in Brooklyn and are not consolidated but are uh, kind of proceeding in alignment. And the others uh, are sort of scattered around in Maryland, in Virginia, in DC, uh, and are trailing behind. But the two cases really are the five in California and the two in Brooklyn. So uh, I don't completely agree with Dan, who said, I think that we can count on DACA for something like another year because the Supreme Court just denied uh, an unusual application by the government for something called certiorari before judgment, trying to jump over the normal process of going to the Court of Appeals and then the Supreme Court. They tried to jump straight into the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court appropriately said, too fast, go through normal order. Um, Right now, the, um, the five cases in California are pending before the Ninth Circuit. Uh, the government has filed its opening brief. All the briefing will be completed by early April. The court has not set argument, but it's likely to hold argument in May or maybe early June. Um, and uh, I think it's entirely possible, given that the Ninth Circuit has expedited the cases, um, that there will be a decision by the early fall. Um, it, it could take much longer, especially if there's dissenting opinions and so forth. But it, it would not be unusual to have a decision from the Ninth Circuit by the early to mid-fall, which would allow the government an opportunity to go back to the Supreme Court, and this time to ask for a stay, which they didn't ask for it last time. I don't know that they will ask for a stay. They have not yet sought a stay in their other appeals. Um, so I, I don't assume that they will. On the other hand, it was such an unusual move they made trying to jump the queue that perhaps they thought uh, they wouldn't push their luck, and this time around they might. I certainly don't think that if it's up to Jeff Sessions to decide whether to leave DACA in place or request a stay from the Supreme Court that we can trust that he will leave it in place. So I'm, uh, unfortunately, I think there could be a renewed application of the Supreme Court, including perhaps for a stay of the orders protecting DACA as early as the mid-fall. If I had to bet a dollar, I would say either they won't ask or the court won't grant it, and the DACA will continue for a year, as Dan says, but I don't want to suggest that that's a certain thing, unfortunately. The, the New York cases are trailing a little bit behind. Um, the New York cases are now in the Second Circuit. The government has requested an expedited briefing schedule, as it did in the California cases. Uh, has not sought a stay, uh, so it's proceeding in the same way. The court has not yet set a schedule, um, but there is uh, no possibility that we will be uh, finished with briefing by early April, uh, and so probably the New York cases are a couple months behind the California cases, at least through the briefing and argument part. 
And then again, it will depend on how quickly the judges choose to write their opinions, whether there are dissenting or concurring opinions and so forth. But we could also have a decision from the Second Circuit by the mid-fall uh, without any unusual activity. That, that could happen as early as mid-fall or maybe into the winter if they stay a few months behind as they've been. Um, at the end of the day, uh, and uh, uh, my students and I uh, represent the plaintiffs in the, the first of these 11 cases that was filed and in uh, the lead case of the two in New York. Um, uh, we have acknowledged, as all the lawyers and all the parties have, that the president has the power to terminate DACA. Obama had the power to order DACA, to create DACA, and this or any other president has the power to take it away. That is not really in dispute. At some level, all of these cases are efforts to buy time, to point out procedural deficiencies, as Dan said, in the way DACA was terminated, or maybe the reasons for which it was terminated, so as to preserve DACA as long as possible. But at the end of the day, the president can terminate DACA, and I believe the courts will eventually say that, even if they agree with us, as they have so far, that the hasty, slapdash, racist manner in which DACA was terminated on September 5th is not permissible. So this brings me back to my first point. If DACA survives, it will be because young people and their allies have demanded that Congress reestablish it a, in a, on a firmer foundation, a statutory basis, or that the pressure from the movement in the streets will somehow persuade those in the administration to, to drag it out a little longer. Um, I think Congress is the more likely uh, avenue, though, of course, if you have, you know, have you met this Congress? That, you know, uh, it's hard to bet money on them doing uh, any form of legislation upon any topic, practically. So there's obviously serious obstacles there. Uh, my students and I also represent United We Dream, which is the national organization of uh, dreamer organizations, the National Immigrant Youth Network. And so we've spent a lot of time in Washington with uh, legislative staff and legislators and, and been very much involved in uh, fighting off amendments, drafting bills, trying to work that. And so I have no illusions about the difficulties of making any progress there. Uh, that said, I think I'm slightly more optimistic perhaps than maybe Dan implied. Um, the uh, Common Sense Coalition compromise that failed uh, had f 54 votes. It was trying to get to 60. Uh, but there were three Democrats who voted against it who would have voted for it if their votes were necessary. And John McCain would have voted for it if he had been in D.C. He was in Arizona getting treatment. So actually there were 58 votes for that compromise. Um, that's not that far from 60. It's hard to know where those last two come from, but it's not so far off, actually. The House is another matter. Um, okay, so just for um, a couple of minutes, um, uh, I thought I would take you inside. I've lost track a little bit, because Dan went for like 20 minutes or something. That is not true. <laughs> a solid 14 and a half. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, so um, uh, I do think, uh, as I said, that young people have led this movement, and in part they've led it in court. So I want to just take you briefly inside uh, the case that we've been a part of. So. Um, in the summer of 2016, when the Supreme Court surprised most people by going 4-4 uh, and affirming the Texas injunction by an equally divided court, surprised because um, after Scalia died, uh, the court um, uh, uh, issued quick orders in several cases where they were split 4-4, but they didn't do that in the Texas case, which led most Supreme Court observers to predict, oh, so there must actually be an opinion coming because it's not like those other cases that quickly got spit out 4-4. So end of June, when the Supreme Court issues its final decisions of the term, people thought there would be a 5-3 victory, because it was improbable that the four center-left folks would vote uh, against. So there was real surprise when it came out 4-4, leaving the Texas injunction in place. And real, uh, I still remember the, the lead organizer for UWD calling me that morning, uh, uh, sobbing in tears. She was headed into the White House to meet with Obama personally and, and other activists to plan next steps. It was such a punch in the gut. And I'm sure many of you know that and experience something like that yourself. Um, people began calling us at the clinic at Yale. Um, and they said, I remember a year ago when we were feeling stuck under the Fifth Circuit injunction and there was a fear that it wouldn't get to the Supreme Court in time to be reversed. The court in the Fifth Circuit was slow walking the decision. And um, you guys were trying to come up with some theories of attacking the Fifth Circuit decision sideways, 
rather than up through the normal appeals channel. And we all thought those were terrible ideas and they were totally wrong and they had no basis in law. Um, but now it's the summer of 16 and no one has any less bad ideas than your terrible ideas. So what were your terrible ideas again? How is it that we could attack sideways on this nationwide injunction in turn of Texas? And, and it's true, the students had developed some theories that the Texas injunction did not properly bind the entire nation uh, and certainly could not bind other federal courts in all circumstances. We showed our research again and again people said, that's really hard. Uh, and in fact, a number of national organizations who won't be named um, said, we're not going to get in on that case with you because that's sort of too weak. But we thought the least we could do was try in a small way to match the courage of our clients who had risked so much in fighting. And so we went into court. We filed a lawsuit in the summer of 16 in Brooklyn, and we drew Judge Garifus. And we went in for a quick status conference. A student did it, Will Bloom. And we wanted to take the temperature of the judge. And the Department of Justice stood up and said, Judge, we're bound by this injunction. We can't do anything. We are stuck. Uh, how can you order us to open a program up that we've been ordered to close down? And he turned to Will, whose knees were shaking a little bit, and it, Will gave our best answer. And then the judge looked back at the government and he said, you know, I don't really know what that erudite jurist in Texas is up to, but you can tell him I am not marching in his Texas parade. I've got a man, Martin Batali Vidal, sitting in my courtroom. He claims he has rights. I'm a judge in Brooklyn. I'm going to decide his rights. Well, that case got stayed. Uh, we slowed it down after the election surprised everybody. But it, we then amended that case two hours after Jeff Sessions concluded his announcement and went back to Judge Garifus. And since then, the students with our co-counsel have argued, have been in court on every hearing, um, have negotiated with the government, and have secured the preliminary injunction that is the second nationwide injunction that now protects DACA. Um, and whatever happens in the California cases, we will continue to move forward in those cases. And that is a litigation that is led by the students uh, and is being conducted by the students. And it's just one more small example of the way, uh, if we are saved, it will be by you. Thank you. So I would like to just uh, give the audience a chance to get like two questions in, then we'll keep going, but I don't want it just to be the panel. Two questions. Anybody have a question that they want to interject at the moment? Or do you want us to keep going? I have a quick question that I'll interject, and then maybe we'll go back if nobody is going to pipe up. And here's my question. My question is to Dan and Mike. Could the administration, and is the administration working on a rescission, uh, a parallel rescission while the litigation proceeds? That is to say, why not, if they have authority to do it, why aren't they doing it now, to have the process going, come up with a better reason than that it was initially illegal, that the executive authority was illegal. I wondered about that myself, <clears throat> but I think it's similar to the travel ban litigation. Once you demonstrate a certain level of incompetence, and in, in a lot of ways they didn't have to go and make mm -hmm. the assertion that DACA was illegal, which was sort of an open invitation to this uh, arbitrary and capricious thing, it's tough to walk that back now because now it all looks like a post hoc rationalization. So I think it's going to be kind of tricky to, to deal with that, but um, I'll defer to Mike, who's much more engaged in this case. Uh, yeah, I don't have any insight. The Trump administration doesn't talk to me, um, uh, except through court. Um, so I don't know if they're planning something. But um, not all of the claims depend on the quality of the reasons given. Um, so the California judge and the Brooklyn judge enjoined DACA termination on the uh, arbitrary and capricious grounds under the APA. Uh, the California judge dismissed, but the Brooklyn judge has not dismissed a second uh, Administrative Procedure Act claim, which is that the termination of DACA requires notice and comment rulemaking, which is a slower process and cannot be done overnight, even though our position is that the original DACA did not require notice and comment, because it merely created authority. But this is a binding rule that forbids the exercise of authority in all sorts of very specific ways. So. Um, the California judge, as I said, has rejected the notice and comment claim. Uh, the, that is still alive uh, in Brooklyn. And so if that stays alive, that is an independent basis that a, a simply rewriting the reasons mm -hmm. would not be enough. Mm -hmm. There are also the equal protection claims that were alluded to. Uh, and we, uh, not in the California cases, but we also have procedural due process claims that are pending in Brooklyn and have not been dismissed. So there are uh, other ways in, even if they were this afternoon to say, never mind, we've now, instead of a two-page memo, we've now got a 20-page memo mm -hmm. with a lot more footnotes. It's really reasoned now. Let me add one more thing, which is political. It's not as obvious to me that 
Trump personally is as enthusiastic about and repealing DACA at the moment as he was before. I think it connects to this comprehensive immigration reform strategy. I think Jeff Sessions still wants to do it, but I'm not sure that they're on speaking terms, so it may be hard to coordinate. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, yeah. Um, just uh, my first question goes into uh, uh, the pressure that Trump administration have been putting on immigration judges to um, repeat. I repeat that. Uh, my first question goes into the uh, due process question, meaning that the Trump administration have been putting pressure on immigration judges to um, uh, give uh, orders out as fast as they can so they can adjudicate more and more cases, and the pressures uh, are too high that it seems like there are semi-quotas on these judges to get as many people out on, on the proceeding. Um, and the, the question is, if I, am I asking this too early? Maybe they want to talk. No, 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 no I was, I was just, just going to say we should bridge to the other two speakers. Yeah, on this. yeah. Just go so, so my question is, how, how, how do you think that we could uh, protect immigration courts uh, from encroachment of the executive branch, although they're not an Article I um, uh, court yet, but uh, still this encroachment uh, is totally against the due process uh, clause? And... Um, I have a comment about uh, getting people um, out there and the young people. I totally agree with you. I'm, um, uh, I'm from Washington, D.C., and um, I'm an attorney there. I work there, and DACA and uh, travel ban has been my forte right now. But the Congress is really not receptive. Uh, we have been on the Hill almost every day, and the answer is denial. Like, they don't even want to hear it anymore. Some Democrats are, and a big majority of Democrats actually are, but I don't want to make it a bipartisan thing. Congress is not receptive, and the administration is counting on that. How do you go against that? How do you change that besides waiting for 2018 elections? Yeah. So do you want to respond briefly to that, or should we go to Debbie? Uh, I'll just say very last, briefly on the yeah, Congress thing. So Congress. Uh, I agree. The House is a, uh, there's con It's very hard. Everything is very hard. Um, but um, I, I'm a tiny bit more optimistic, actually, about the congressional solution. I, I think that the Senate is really starting to show a tiny bit of independence from the White House. They ignore them in the budget process. They ignore them in the DACA stuff. And if that holds together, that, that could shift things a little bit. But we have no choice. We have to keep going in Congress, and we have to win in 2018. We're going to go to, to answer your first question about enforcement questions. It's really something that Debbie's thought and worked a lot on. So she's going to go ahead and do her, you know, make her comment now on that and, uh, and the wider field. So I'm going to talk briefly about uh, two major policy changes, and hopefully I'll, I'll get to your issue, just raise it at least. Um, two major policies under the Trump administration that we have been engaged with at our clinic. One is increased enforcement and curtailments in due process protection, in, particular, in particular at the immigration court. If I have an extra minute or during question and answers, I can speak about our work now and over the past decade regarding the Safe Third Country Agreement between the United States and Canada, which allows Canada to send back refugees at its border to the U.S. to apply for asylum there, despite consistent and now amplified evidence that the United States is not a safe country for asylum seekers. Okay, I'm going to try to be brief. At least that's what my notes say, I should say. Um, so in terms of increased enforcement, President Trump issued two executive orders in late 2017 regarding interior and border enforcement. I'm just going to address briefly the order and, and subsequent practices regarding interior enforcement. The executive order explicitly ends the prior Obama policy of designating certain immigrants as priorities for enforcement. Obama had prioritized for arrest and removal those undocumented persons who had convictions for serious and violent crimes. Of course, there were lots of contradic contradictions in actual implementation that we can talk about. This system meant that those who were not priorities were shielded from removal by various exercises of discretion and pro pr prosecutorial discretion, various forms of stays on their prior orders of removal, which I'll get into a bit. 
Trump's executive order explicitly ends the priority system so that all undocumented persons are subject to removal. The executive order also commands prosecution, detention, and removal as criminals of all undocumented persons. Technically, under US law, unauthorized entry and reentry are federal crimes. So everyone undocumented, at least persons who, who, who cross the, the US, the southern border, um, technically under US law, entry and reentry are federal crimes. So everyone who entered the country crossed that border, including those previously explicitly allowed to stay under the priority system, is subject to these new policies of prosecution, detention, and removal. In addition, Trump's executive order provided that a truncated removal process called expedited removal is in effect, at, which, which has been in effect at the border since 1996, will be extended throughout the country. Execu uh, expedited removal allows an arresting DHS immigration official to determine if the person is unauthorized and should be immediately removed without any administrative due process hearing. I'm going to put due process here in quotes. A person who expresses fear of returning is supposed to be sent for a credible fear screening interview determine, to determine if they have a significant possibility of establishing eligibility for, to apply for asylum, eligibility for asylum. And if so, they proceed to a full asylum hearing. The executive order mandates the extension of, of expedited removal beyond the border region to the interior throughout the United States. Formal extension, and this uh, picks up on some of the, the issues of, of um, notice and comment that were raised before, formal extension of, executive, of expedited removal throughout the country requires rulemaking. The executive order acknowledges that, that they would have to, get, they would have to engage in administrative procedure rulemaking and notice and comment. The Department of Justice and DHS have not moved in that direction of rulemaking. And instead, DOJ has taken various measures to curtail procedural rights in regular removal hearings. Again, I'll talk about that a little bit, and then we can go into it in Q&A. First, enhanced enforcement. How has it worked? Enforcement is now taking place throughout the country. Again, now everyone is a target. Priorities, or the non-priority system for removal, are now being established by individual ICE officers and, office, and officers. ICE officers say, finally, our shackles are off. Um, so what are the practices? In many respects, the practices now is going after low-hanging low fruit. Orders of supervision and check-ins. Over the years, and especially during Obama's last term, purses formally ordered removed, but not priorities for removal, were given what are called orders of supervision. Such persons would be given stays on removal and required to report to ICE for regular check-ins, often annual check-ins, and the stays on their removal would be extended, and they could get work authorization. All of a sudden, under the Trump administration, these stays were not extended, or they were suddenly lifted. We have clients who showed up for these check-ins, which they have been doing for years, and were immediately detained for removal on the next flight. We had a client, uh, we, we, assist, we were helping um, Catholic Charities in New York um, in a case involving an Indonesian Christian um, man who had been in the country for 10 years. He had four US citizen children, one of whom had Down syndrome. He was the only one available for his uh, for their support. Um, he, he didn't even have a traffic, bio, tra traffic ticket in his record. He was like the most squeaky clean person on earth. Um, he goes in for his annual check-in. He's immediately detained for, for removal, for, for literally to be put on a flight to Indonesia. And of course, it raises also these asylum issues of people, uh, Indonesian ch uh, Christians, and the escalating persecution of them um, in Indonesia. He, like, he wouldn't get off the floor when he was, uh, he was, um, he got down on the floor, they tried to pick him up, he got injuries, he had to be hospitalized. Um, they, um, so that's just, I could talk about sort of what happened with his case. Eventually, um, they filed a, um, we filed a 
a stay before the First Circuit. He had a motion to reopen pending in immigration court, um, but I'm sorry, pending before the Board of Immigration Appeals. The Board of Immigration Appeals wouldn't act on the stay, so he had no denial of his motion to reopen. If he'd had a denial on the motion to reopen, he would have had clear access to First Circuit review. So he's in this ambiguous status, which I think a lot of people are now with motions to reopen pending before the board. If the board would just deny them, they could get into federal court. The board sits on them and uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't grant a stay so people can be, uh, can be technically removed. The First Circuit here um, just sent the case down to New Jersey where he was being held and said this is a habeas action uh, in, in uh, federal district court in, uh, in New Jersey and should be treated as that. And eventually things smoothed out. Um, we have clients who request extensions of stay and receive them or are set up in a, on a sort of expedited docket. Shorter periods of a supervision, never knowing at which check-in they, they will not get an extension, but they'll be detained and removed. We're working with advocates across the country to figure out what to do. We're negotiating with local ICE officials. Remember, priorities are now being established on an arbitrary basis at the local office. Fear. Nobody knows what will happen. Trump has effectively revoked policies regarding sensitive locations. These are pol this was a policy established about 2011 where there was an understanding that certain locations like schools and hospitals um, were safe areas where you could, ICE, ICE enforcement operations would not take place. Um, there are no, no longer any, any sensitive locations. There have been uh, several reports of parents bringing their children to school, dropping their kids up to, off for school, dropping them at the bus station, and getting picked up. Um, and removed. And again, some of these are asylum seekers, some of these again are sort of Indonesian Christians. That, I mean, these are just the stories that we sort of know about. Courthouses. Courthouses were not technically a sensitive location under, um, under Obama, but there was an understanding that you know, they would only be used. Oh, my time is out. Oh, my God, I didn't even talk about. Okay. Just a couple Okay, so in terms of, in terms of the, the immigration court. Um, this is where uh, immigrants have the right to um, some sort of due process hearing. And what's happening, as you mentioned, is that one of the, one of the major things that has happened is that, uh, is that um, Mr. Sessions has ordered the, uh, cons reconsideration, asked for brief uh, briefing on the question of whether judges have the power to administratively close cases. Um, whether they have the power to manage their dockets, whether they have the power to grant continuances. And these are issues that we're assisting in litigation with um, the Aiken Gump firm and a group of uh, retired immigration judges and board members. So I'm happy to talk about it some more, but that's it. I think what we'll do is just hear a few minutes from Sabi on TPS and then have time for questions. Sound good? Yeah. I'm just gonna speak for literally two minutes so we can at least have a few questions. Um, I think the reason we wanted to talk about TPS is because um, the issues surrounding DACA get a lot of airtime, and I think there are a lot of really important and equally, equally challenging issues surrounding TPS that unfortunately don't get as much airtime. So um, temporary protected status, raise your hand if you know what it is. Great, okay, so um, as hopefully most of you know, uh, temporary protected status for um, over 300,000 people in the US is gonna be coming to an end in the next year and a half, um, unless some of the lawsuits that Dan referenced earlier are successful in, um, in preventing uh, the president from and the Department of Homeland Security from terminating temporary protected status. And so, um, in addition to the lawsuit that Dan referenced by the NAACP Legal Defense Fund challenging uh, the termination of TPS based on a violation of equal protection, there was a lawsuit that was filed by Centro Presente, which is a local NGO here that's done amazing work um, organizing and leading uh, a, a worker-led movement um, surrounding um, advocacy for workers' rights and uh, filed a lawsuit challenging the termination of TPS for Salvadorans as well as Haitians. 
And so it remains to be seen what will happen with both of these lawsuits. But um, if they're successful, then uh, TPS would not be eliminated for over 300,000 people. Who did you draw in Massachusetts? Hmm? Who's the judge in Massachusetts? I don't know who the judge is in Massachusetts, but I can check. Um, so anyway, uh, in addition to these sy systemic challenges to the rescission and end of TPS, what a lot of people are doing, including our clinic, is doing a, a lot of community outreach and screening people who have TPS to see what longer form, longer term forms of relief they're eligible for. So on our campus, members of the Harvard community are being screened by our clinic and Jason, who's here, um, is leading the charge on that, uh, along with clinic students. And uh, in the greater Boston area, um, we're working with community-based organizations like Centro Presente, like City Life, and other places to, to meet with as many people as we can who have TPS to see what else they might be eligible for. And oftentimes, because people with TPS on average have lived here in the US for uh, 15 years, 20 years, um, and have never had to question the work authorization and the right to remain here that TPS gave them, they haven't had a chance to do a consultation with a lawyer because it just wasn't something that seemed necessary. Um, and so as we talk to people, it, it becomes clear that a lot of people do have longer term forms of relief available to them, either through their family members or because of their fears of return to their home country or because of things that have happened to them during their 20 years here in the US that would provide them with the pathway to getting a green card. Um, and so I think the advocacy efforts and, um, and all of the work that organizations like Centro and others are doing um, are leading the charge and hopefully um, encouraging people to do those kinds of consultations. Great. So questions from the audience. We can get the mic to you. My question is that the, the struggle around DACA and TPS is situated in a larger struggle around the immigrants in general, the undocumented. And a number of the DACA representatives who I've known have made this point that there are not good immigrants and bad immigrants, and that they don't want to be pitted against the, the struggle for the undocumented to have legal status and to be represented as human beings in the society, and that they're confronting an administration that seems hell-bent on not doing that, and if anything, you know, demonizing the whole immigrant community. How do you deal with that? I mean, you know, within the specifics of like the, the legal battles that you're involved in, how do you actually handle that? Because it seems like most recently there was a whole effort to pit DACA against the rest of the undocumented community and say, hold them hostage and say, well, we'll give you this, but in turn of that, you're gonna have to uh, agree to uh, an incredible number of immoral acts. So I was just wondering how you respond to that or deal with that in your work. Well, I would just begin by saying I think it's an incredibly important problem, and there's a political aspect to it, and there's a doctrinal aspect to it. And doctrinally, one of the things that I like about some of the theories is that they're not based on that particular bifurcation. I think the Obama administration made a terrible error in saying things like we're focusing on felons, not families, as if it was somehow legitimate to focus on people who committed crimes or as if they didn't have families. You know, that whole framing has been very pernicious. Some of the value of these technical arguments is that they don't depend on that particular framing, and that's a value of arbitrary and capricious analysis, proportionality analysis. A lot of the administrative law theories relate to forcing the government to do its job. But politically, I agree it's a deep problem, and now that the pressure is sort of off, the idea of DACA being the tip of the spear on a broader comprehensive movement is very problematic anyway. But I think that was always problematic as a framing. I would add that uh, my experience with movement leaders is that they are extraordinarily sophisticated about this, um, very thoughtful, and uh, very clear that they will not be bargaining chips uh, as to their parents, uh, and they are not something to be traded around. At the same time, in my experience, the movement leaders are very practical and uh, have a kind of a situational awareness, by which I mean, in, your, in court, arguments are somewhat constrained by rules of evidence and procedure and so forth, and individual clients have a lawyer who is obliged to fight as hard as they can for that client in whatever way possible, and that's what we all do in all of our individual cases. In a legislature, whether it's Congress or whether it's the state legislature or city, Boston City Council on some local policy, 
Um, the rule, there are rules there too, but they're generally more flexible and don't constrain in the same ways. But political compromise is often required to make progress. And um, my sense is that people are well aware of that too. And I, the last thing I'll say is that, um, two quick things. Um, the, I think there's a generational um, uh, uh, situation going on in which the folks who are like me and Dan and Debbie, old enough to remember the legislative debate in 2006 7 and in 2013, where really bad deals kept getting worse and worse and worse. And eventually, labor unions and immigrant rights groups and Latino organizations and religious groups said, This is too bad a deal. We, we have to walk away. And they went down. And some of us are haunted by, like, that was true. That analysis was great. Those were terrible deals. But it's 10 years, and millions of people would have benefited from those terrible deals. And so I think there is a, I have an impression that the generation who's been through these battles is a little bit more like, oh, if we just say no now to a terrible deal, it could be another five years, 10 years, we have to do something. And, um, and younger uh, leaders uh, are more uh, principled at some level and holding out longer against bad deals, which is not a bad bargaining strategy, uh, I will say as a lawyer. One other little thing. I don't think even in litigation you have to do what uh, we call poster child litigation. Dan mentioned the Jennings case, a terrible decision last week by the Supreme Court. Uh, our clinic represents the, the class of long-term detainees like Jennings here in New England, in the state of Massachusetts. All New England detainees are basically, just about all are in Massachusetts. We represent the class of long-term detainees seeking bond hearings. It's the same issue, it's the same case. We filed that case for one person. He was the, just the second client we had in that situation. He has an extensive criminal history, close to 30 convictions. Not all minor, nonviolent offenses. We took our client as we found him. He was illegally detained, we went to court. Lots of lawyers would have said, great issue, wrong client, hold out, screen. We thought, no, it's actually important to make his story, his life experience, as much a part of this public conversation, including in court, as that of the veteran who has never been convicted of anything and you know has worked and you know ran into burning buildings and saved 20 children and, and all of those things too, which are wonderful things, but the variety of experience is not captured only in poster children. Maybe we can push it to one more. Why you've got them? Really quickly, who and is anybody working on the conditions in the jails? I'm just saying jails and not detention centers. And the problems that detainees are facing and experiencing right now, every day. Uh, yes, but not enough people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was a quick question. Anybody have another one? Hello, I have a very, very, very hypothetical question, and I hope you can help me with it. Suppose that I have temporary protected status. I have had a career in uh, being a custodian, and uh, given the uncertainty of my situation, I decide that instead of being an employee uh, at a university, I would take my experience and that collective experience of my peers and uh, begin a property management company. What would be the steps that I should consider in terms of uh, lending credibility to my efforts and um, seeking to enter contractual relationships with the types of employers that my collective used to work at? Uh, my first piece of advice is you should get a lawyer, <laughs> hypothetically speaking. Or two. <laughs> um, but uh, in the hypothetical you described, it is not unlawful to run a business even if you lack status. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's, no, there's nothing unlawful about incorporating a business and entering into contractual relations even if the principal or the, the president CEO of the business uh, lacks immigration status. Um, and um, 
there, uh, I don't know, Massachusetts licensing rules and corporation rules, and there may be issues around bank loans and so, you know, financing a company and so forth. But as a starting proposition, there's nothing unlawful about that plan. But I would not go forward without benefit of counsel um, who knows business law in, in Massachusetts, for instance, if that's where this company were located. Thank you. We can give you, if this is a real case, we, we can give you the names of some lawyers to go to. There are some weird pathways through which that could actually lead to some immigration status, but it's incredibly complicated and difficult, I mean, to start a business and create a corporation. And, I mean, it's not completely impossible, so I would certainly talk to an immigration lawyer in addition to the business lawyer, but I don't want to give false hope. It, it would be a very, very long and difficult pathway, if possible, at all. Like having an American child, a corporation. Yeah, well, Just, yeah. we're getting to that point. <laughs> okay, so I want to thank the panel uh, for a wonderful session and invite you, insofar as they're willing to stay around for a few more minutes, to come up and engage with them more informally. Thank you very much. <laughs>